Join me in prayer before we get started. Loving Father, as we examine this passage about you judging the judge, we ask that you would open our hearts to the exhortation that, that you're setting before us here, and that you would give us hearts of humility, that we would, we would not be like Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, but we would be like Christ. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Good morning. We are quickly approaching the end of our study through the book of Jeremiah after multiple interruptions along the way. I expect that, uh, that we'll have two more messages after this one, and then we'll, we'll be done. Our passage this morning is Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51. And my title is, When God's Hammer Enjoys Hammering too much. <laughs> when I shared that title with uh, our sermon discussion group on Wednesday and, and with the elders, uh, Bob replied and said, I think you hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> you have to know Bob to appreciate the, the pun. Uh, these two chapters that show up just before the end of the book of Jeremiah come as something of a surprise considering the role that Babylon has served throughout the book up to this point. The heart of these two chapters is captured very pointedly in chapter 50, verse 23, which says, How the hammer of the whole earth has been cut off and broken. How Babylon has become an object of horror among the nations. Babylon is mentioned 169 times in the book of Jeremiah, far more than in any other book of the Bible. <laughs> That's almost as many times as Judah is mentioned in this book. So it's safe to say that Babylon plays a central role in the book of Jeremiah. And what is that role? Well, the astonishing truth about Babylon is that throughout most of the book of Jeremiah, Babylon is presented as God's own agent, God's chosen instrument of judgment to judge his own people and to judge many other nations. In other words, Babylon is the hammer of the whole earth, and God is the one who chose that hammer and who is swinging that hammer throughout this book. The imagery that, uh, this imagery is presented very vividly in uh, chapter 50, verses 20 to 23. You can almost hear the hammering in, as I read these, these verses. Chapter 51, 51, verses 20 to 23. Yahweh says to Babylon, you are my war club, my weapon of war, and with you I shatter nations and with you I destroy kingdoms. With you I shatter the horse and its rider. With you I shatter the chariot and its rider. With you I shatter man and woman. With you I shatter old man and youth. With you I shatter young man and virgin. With you I shatter the shepherd and his flock. With you I shatter the farmer and his team. And with you I shatter governors and prefects. God paints a, a formidable word picture of himself, Yahweh, wielding this war club named Babylon, shattering the nations in fierce judgment with blow after blow. How did Babylon come into this role as the war club of God? Well, I'll back up a little bit to Jeremiah chapter 27, starting at that fir the first verse. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, Thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourselves bonds and yokes and put them on your neck, and send word to the king of Edom, to the king of Moab, to the king of the sons of Ammon, to the king of Tyre, and to the king of Sidon by the messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Command them to go to their masters, saying, Thus says 
Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. I will give it to the one who is pleasing in, in my sight. And who is this nation that was pleasing in God's sight? Who is this nation to whom God gave dominion over all of the nations he just listed? Was it Judah? The nation that descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The nation whom God declared to be his own covenant people? His own inheritance? His own treasure? No, it was not Judah. Not yet. Starting in the next verse of Jeremiah 27, God reveals who it was to whom he had given authority over the whole earth. Verse 6, Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. As we work through these passages, notice how often the, the animals, the wild animals, enter into the picture. And then verse 7 says, All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes, and then many nations and great kings will make him their servant. So God makes it clear right at the outset that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon would one day be on the receiving end of his judgment. But for the time being, God goes on to say, verse 8, it will be that the nation or the kingdom which will not serve him, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, declares the Lord, until I have destroyed it by his hand, by Nebuchadnezzar's hand. A few verses later, God singles out Judah, his own people, to make sure that they and their king, Zedekiah, fully get the fact that this declaration of God concerning all the nations applies every bit as much to them as it does to the nations around them. Jeremiah writes in verse 12, I spoke words like all of these to Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and serve him and his people, and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword, famine, and pestilence, as Yahweh has spoken to that nation which will not serve the king of Babylon? As we know from all that we've already seen in this powerful book, King Zedekiah and the Judahites definitely did not heed this crystal clear command and warning from God. They steadfastly refused to submit to, to Babylon as the instrument of God's corrective judgment against them. By that refusal, Judah was casting off the authority of the one who was holding the hammer called Babylon. And that one, of course, was Yahweh. How had Nebuchadnezzar, of all people, come to be the object of God's favor and the instrument of God's activity in judging so many nations? I believe that God's answer is found in the first several chapters of the book of Daniel. Now, I'm going to bounce back and forth a bit between Daniel and Jeremiah to drive home a couple of points about Nebuchadnezzar and God's agenda for Nebuchadnezzar. I'll ask you to worry less about which passage I'm in than about just catching the story that God presents as we look at, at pieces of these two books, Daniel and Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar's reign over Babylon lasted roughly 43 years. It was a pretty long run as kings went back then. From 605 B.C. to about 562 B.C., but very early in that reign, very early in, in Nebuchadnezzar's time as king of Babylon, something happened to him 
that he would never have expected. In the second year of his reign, that means around 603 BC, God intervened in Nebuchadnezzar's life through three, uh, through excuse me, four young Hebrew men whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into captivity in Babylon in the early phase of his conquest of Judah. Those young men were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, the last three of those men we know mostly by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Through the uncompromising faithfulness of those four young men to the one true God, and through God's mighty interventions to save those four men from Nebuchadnezzar's tyranny, that pagan king of the pagan nation of Babylon came to an amazing conclusion that we find him declaring in Daniel chapter 3, verse 29, where he says, There is no other God besides the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who is able to deliver the way their God is. In the next chapter of Daniel, chapter 4, Yahweh, the one true God, raises Nebuchadnezzar's knowledge of him to a much more personal level. God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel that because of his unbridled arrogance, he, Nebuchadnezzar, was going to be driven away from mankind and given grass to eat like cattle. He would be drenched with the dew of heaven until he came to recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And don't miss that last part. The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Now, it's no coincidence that that sounds a lot like Jeremiah chapter 27 when God said to Judah, I have made the earth, the men, and the beasts which are on the face of the earth by my great power, by my outstretched arm, and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Daniel, he, in Daniel, he says, I will bestow it on whomever I wish. In Jeremiah, he says, I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. And in both of those passages, God is asserting his authority not only over men, but over the beasts of the earth. In Daniel, chapter 4, right after telling Nebuchadnezzar about the great humiliation that God was about to inflict on him, Daniel implores the king and he says, Break away now, Nebuchadnezzar, from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. See, God, through Daniel, God is handing Nebuchadnezzar the opportunity to repent and not to suffer this grievous humiliation that's been prophesied against him. But Nebuchadnezzar did not heed that crystal clear warning from God. One year later, as he was walking on the rooftop of his palace in Babylon, taking in the view of his vast domain, by the way, King David could have told him that was a very hazardous thing for a king to do. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar said, Is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While he was still saying these things, a voice came from heaven telling him that everything that Daniel had prophesied a year earlier was now going to happen to him. And it did. Nebuchadnezzar was brought very low by God. He was driven away from mankind. He was made to eat grass with the beasts of the field for, quote, seven periods of time. His hair grew out like eagle's feathers and his fingernails became like bird's claws. So I take the seven periods of time to be seven years, not seven months or seven weeks. And then at the end of Daniel 4, we read 
what is probably the most marvelous declaration about the one true God ever made by a king who was not an Israelite or a Judahite. Listen to verses 34 to 37. But at the end of the period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and I honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now listen once again to Jeremiah 27, verses 4 through 6. Thus says Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, I have made the earth, the man, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. You think that last part about wild animals was just kind of thrown in there with no effect? No. I believe God was saying to Nebuchadnezzar, I, Yahweh, the same one who made you, Nebuchadnezzar, eat grass alongside the wild animals of the field, I have now given them into your hands along with all the nations. I believe it was entirely by God's doing that he had made Nebuchadnezzar pleasing in his sight, and he had done so by humbling him. And he had humbled him by humiliating him. That's generally how human beings get humility. God had very deliberately groomed this man, Nebuchadnezzar, to be his instrument instrument of judgment against his own beloved people and against the people of many nations. God had taught Nebuchadnezzar very personally the surpassing importance of humility before God as that which prepares a man to bear the sacred task of acting as God's agent in his judgment of other men. So if God had prepared Nebuchadnezzar to act with humility as his agent of judgment against Judah and against the nations around Judah, how is it that now in Jeremiah chapter 50 to 51, God prophesies an even more fierce and complete judgment against Babylon than against Judah? Before we get to God's answer to that question, we need to understand the magnitude of the judgment that God prophesies against Babylon in these two chapters, Jeremiah 50 and 51. The first three verses of chapter 50 say this, The word which Yahweh spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through Jeremiah the prophet, declare and proclaim among the nations, Pro proclaim it and lift up a standard, do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured, Bel has been put to shame, Marduk has been shattered, her images have been put to shame, her idols have been shattered. Bel and Marduk were gods of Babylon. 
for a nation has come up against her out of the north. It will make her land an object of horror, and there, there will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off. They have gone away. And then verse 12 says, Your mother will be greatly ashamed. She who gave you birth will be humiliated. Behold, she will be the least of the nations, a wilderness, a parched land, a desert. Because of the indignation of Yahweh, she will not be inhabited, but she will be completely desolate. Everyone who passes by Babylon will be horrified and will hiss because of all of her wounds. And here are the last three verses of chapter 51. You, O Yahweh, have promised concerning this place to cut it off so that there will be nothing to dwell in it, whether man or beast, but it will be a perpetual desolation. And then Jeremiah says to his scribe, Sir, uh, uh, his name is, um, should remember that, Sariah, his scribe Sariah. Jeremiah says, as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you will tie a stone to it and you will throw it into the middle of the Euphrates River and say, just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise up again because of the calamity that I am going to bring upon her and they will become spent. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Unlike with Judah and with several of the other nations that received prophecies from God of harsh judgment in this book, Babylon does not also receive a prophecy of restoration and renewal. God's word to Babylon ends with Babylon an uninhabited desolation never to rise up again. So why does Babylon receive such a fierce judgment from God's hand? It makes me think of, uh, of another passage. I can't raise the address at the moment, but it says, to whom, from him to whom much has been given, much will be, re much will be required. Why does Babylon receive such a fierce judgment from God's hand? Well, God's answer is that Babylon enjoyed being his hammer way too much. Throughout Daniel, God had given Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, through Daniel, through the prophet Daniel, God had given Nebuchadnezzar an up-close example of the heart of humility and compassion that he requires of his agents. When Daniel came to Nebuchadnezzar bearing the prophecy of God's humiliating judgment against him, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, My Lord, if only this dream in which the prophecy came to him applied to those who hate you, and if only its inter interpretation applied to your adversaries. See, Daniel did not enjoy passing along this word from God concerning the painful humiliation that was about to befall Nebuchadnezzar. Now God had put Babylon in Daniel's position, not merely to announce his judgment against the nations that persisted in rebelling against him, but to execute that judgment on God's behalf, to be the hammer of God. But, but Babylon did not treat that sacred assignment with anything like the humility of Daniel. Far from it. Instead, Babylon delighted in executing violent judgment against Judah and all the nations. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah wrote about Babylon well before Jeremiah came onto the scene and long before any of these events actually unfolded. In Isaiah 14, verses 4 through 6, God declares his coming judgment against Babylon and his restoration of Israel and Judah as if those events had already happened. 
he says that Babylon used to strike the peoples with fury, with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. Unceasing strokes, unrestrained persecution, doled out in anger. Babylon loved being the hammer. Not because they loved Yahweh, but because they loved self-importance and power and control. They loved the wealth of nations that fell into their hands. They loved being the hammer so much that they became utterly unrestrained in their hammering. They used their divine commission as if it gave them a carte blanche, a get-out-of-jail-free card that justified their love of bloodshed and un unconstrained violence. See, Babylon, who was supposed to be the instrument of God, acted in a manner that violated the character of God instead of enforcing the character of God. This is hugely important, beloved. The point of being God's agent is to do as God does, not as man does. But God does not take pleasure in executing fierce judgments against men. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 31 to 32, in the aftermath of God's fierce judgment against Judah and Jerusalem after the fall of the city, Jeremiah says this about Yahweh. He says, For the Lord will not reject forever, for if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant covenant-keeping love, for he does not afflict from the heart, or grieve the sons of men. Let me read that again. God does not afflict from the heart, or grieve the sons of men. That's the literal translation. Beloved, the case is very clear in the Bible that God does not execute destructive judgment from the heart. Jeremiah chapter 32 tells us what God does do with his whole heart and with his whole soul. And that is, he redeems and restores and builds and blesses. That's what God loves to do. But it was not so with Babylon, his agent. Jeremiah 50, verse 11, God says to Babylon, because you are glad, because you are jubilant, O oh, you who pillage my heritage, because you skip about like a threshing heifer and neigh like stallions. That's why this judgment is coming upon you. This ruthless overstepping and acting as God's instrument of, of corrective judgment of his own people is exactly the same sin that God addressed through the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, an angel speaking to the prophet Zechariah gave him this assignment. He said, Proclaim, saying, Thus says Yahweh of armies, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the nations who are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. They furthered the disaster. God was a little angry with Israel and Judah for their gross infidelities and idolatries. And look at what that very restrained measure of God's anger got them. But God says that he was very angry with the nations who were at ease. Why? because of the ferocity with which they acted as the agents of God's corrective judgment against his people, turned God's painful, fatherly discipline into cruel destruction. That's the problem that these chapters address, beloved. That was the sin of Babylon. 
And these chapters expose a tendency in the hearts of sinful men that makes all of us badly prone to fail when we act as agents of God in his work of judging and correcting men. Babylon liked being God's hammer. They liked it so much that they refused to stop hammering when God told them to do so. They furthered the disaster. So in Jeremiah chapter 50, God says, Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. Yahweh has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose is against Babylon to destroy it, for it is the vengeance of Yahweh. Vengeance for his temple. And I said that was chapter 50. That's chapter 51, verse 11. Vengeance, for, the vengeance of Yahweh, vengeance for his temple. The mention of the temple in Jerusalem is very significant. If Nebuchadnezzar had remained in the humility that God had so graciously put in his heart, through the events that, that are recorded in Daniel 3 and 4. Nebuchadnezzar certainly would not have taken any pleasure in the destruction of Yahweh's temple. But he did take pleasure in that destruction. He was gleeful and unrestrained in that destruction. So now he was about to face the unrestrained wrath of God. So what was it that made Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon enjoy executing destructive judgments that went beyond what God had commissioned them to do on his behalf? Well, at the very heart of Nebuchadnezzar's and Babylon's epic failure to act rightly as God's agents was the oldest and most destructive sin of all. Simple, ugly pride. Arrogance against God. That's what God calls it here. Chapter 50, verse 29, God says of Babylon that she has become arrogant against Yahweh, against the Holy One of Israel. Arrogant against the Holy One. You see the irony? Verse 31, chapter 50. Behold, I am against you, O arrogant one, declares Yahweh, God of armies. For your day has come, the time when I will punish you. The arrogant one will stumble and fall with no one to raise him up. In the original text, the phrase arrogant one that happens twice in those two verses is actually just the noun arrogance. So let me read it again with that in mind. Behold, I am against you, O arrogance, declares Yahweh, God of armies. For your day has come, the time when I will punish you. Arrogance will stumble and fall with no one to raise him up. How would you like it if God changed your name to arrogance and wrote that name down for countless generations to read? Babylon's undoing was simple, ugly pride. And because God alone is worthy of all of our boasting, all pride in self, all pride in self is arrogance against God. You cannot be proud of yourself without directing your arrogance against God because He's the only one who is worthy of any pride. He's the only one who's worthy of any boasting. When we rely on ourselves and when we boast in ourselves and honor ourselves, we are robbing the one who made us of what belongs exclusively to him. What a terrible minefield is earthly success. Power, influence, fame, Wealth, these are habits that do not know how to restrain themselves. How quickly and coercively such things turn our hearts from God to us. 
when God reaches into our lives to constrain, to limit our accomplishments, we tend to interpret that as unkindness on God's part. That's not unkindness, beloved. That's grace. Until we take our last breath on this earth, every time God shuts down the success of our self-reliance, He's being gracious to us. And God has zero tolerance for gloating when it's someone else's success that He's shutting down. It's never good for us to gloat when, when it's someone other than us that God is humbling. And when God's constructive work to humble people before him moves to the level of destructive work to avenge himself against those who will not be humbled in his sight, it is never good for us to delight in his judgment of those poor souls. Toward the end of Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent some of his followers ahead of him to a village of Samaria to make arrangements for his arrival there. The Samaritans in that city did not receive him because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem, and the Samaritans didn't like Jerusalem because they didn't like Jews. When James and John heard of the Samaritans' refusal to welcome Jesus, they said to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> I believe James and John were thinking of the time in 2 Kings chapter 1 when Elijah the prophet called down fire from heaven to consume soldiers that had been sent against him by Israel's, Israel's arrogant king Ahaziah, who, by the way, ruled from the city of Samaria. When James and John asked Jesus if he wanted them to command fire to come down from heaven and consume this later batch of hard-hearted Samaritans, Jesus rebuked them. Why? He rebuked them for asking such a question of the one who had come from heaven to earth to give his life to save lost sinners. How can we, whom God has graciously redeemed from our enslavement to sin and made his own in Christ, how can we call down fire from heaven against sinners? The fact that we have a tendency to overstep and to be prideful in acting as God's agents, to correct or to even to avenge himself against others on his behalf, is evident in many passages in the Bible. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26, Paul says to Timothy, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. When God chooses to use you and me as his ambassadors on earth to correct sinners or to announce his intention to judge sinners, we must not take pleasure in passing along that terrible proclamation. Our attitude toward sinners who are still under captivity to sin and to Satan must never be to delight in seeing them get what we deserve from God. It must be to desire for them to to, to receive instead the salvation that none of us deserves, the salvation that we have already been given by God. Instead of hoping to be instruments of their well-deserved judgment from the hand of God, we must earnestly hope to be instruments of their entirely undeserved redemption 
by the hand of God. Knowing always that we are as undeserving as they are. See, the heart of usefulness to God is humility before God. There is a vast difference between those two attitudes when it comes to addressing sin and others, an attitude of, of wanting them to receive the worst from God's hand and wanting them to receive the best from God's hand. It's the difference between man's ways and God's ways. And a different, it's a difference that we can never afford to take lightly, beloved. The cure for our vigorous tendency to enjoy hammering too much is for God to hammer some more on us. The cure for pride is humbling. And humbling gen generally requires humiliation by the hand of God. It's very painful to be the object of God's work to humble, but it is indispensable if we want to be mightily used by God in this world and in His church. God is very good at teaching humility. A great deal of what we read in the Gospels about Jesus' preparation of His disciples focuses on His work to humble them before God and men in order to prepare them to carry on the mantle of the work of Christ after his departure. Bob mentioned in our Wednesday discussion how Jesus, a carpenter by trade, rep repeatedly humbled a group of fishermen by trade, men named Peter and Andrew, James and John, who were all professional fishermen, Twice, Jesus saw to it that those men spent an entire night net fishing in the very lake where they had fished all their lives, but catching absolutely nothing. Now, if you've ever done net fishing, you know it's actually really hard to catch nothing, even if you're really bad at it. The fact that they caught nothing was as much a miracle as what happened next. When Jesus told these professional fishermen where and how to cast their nets, and suddenly when they did what he told them, their nets were filled with more fish than the men could even bring into their boats, more fish than they had ever caught in their lives. This is God's way with his children. He made us to be utterly dependent on him, so he teaches us that we control nothing. And when we forget, he teaches us again. Beloved, God will always meet you at your point of greatest perceived expertise and strength. And he will faithfully frustrate your efforts to control your situation through any sufficiency that you find in yourself. He will do this over and over and over again in your life to burn into your soul the profoundly simple and profoundly vital truth that Solomon declared in Psalm 127. He said, unless Yahweh builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless Yahweh guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved, even in his sleep. God humbles us to make us useful for his eternally good purposes in the lives of other prideful people. And when God humbles us, we're supposed to stay humbled. <laughs> if we don't, maybe even when we do, another humbling will no doubt follow shortly. And every time it does, beloved, every time it does, that's a good thing. Let's pray. Dear Father, give us the heart of Daniel when you use us to correct others.
a heart of humility, gentleness, and mercy. And when we are on the receiving end of your correction, make us very quick to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And then teach us, Father, to cling to that humility, to love it, to embrace it. Because you, Lord, you are the only one worthy of praise. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.